Thank you for joining us on the Overcomers Overcoming podcast series, where we profile those who have overcome or those who are in the process of overcoming any life topic. We have three objectives with this podcast series. Our first objective is we want you to know that whatever you're experiencing in life, whatever you're encountering, you're not alone. We want to enjoin you to let you know that we together can help you through whatever challenge you may have that at the time may seem too difficult to be able to overcome. Our second objective is to help you determine with a very confident resolve, there are multiple solutions, multiple factors involved in any life encounter. It's a matter of thinking into and thinking through the life situation you are encountering to determine the various options, the various solutions that are available to you. Our third objective is to help you with critical thinking skills. If whatever you're experiencing is a result of a decision you made sometime in the past, such that if you had a life redo, you would make a different decision, we want to help you determine the objective facts and factors to evaluate to help you reach a more informed decision. I'm Ron Cooper, founder of the Cooper Culture. I'm with my wife and business partner, Marty. Together, we are the Cooper Culture, and the Cooper Culture is sponsoring this podcast series. Today, we feature Dr. Laurie Weiss, who has life experience of overcoming stereotypes. She was raised in a family who had a stereotype that women are supposed to fit in any of three roles, and she, I think, over a period of time, felt that particularly in the presence of four women who were mentors to her, that she has capabilities beyond what the stereotypes were holding for her. It's a very intriguing story. You'll learn from Dr. Weiss. She overcame those stereotypes and has accomplished a lot in her life. Marty, what are some takes from a lady's point of view? Ron, one of the takes I got from Dr. Weiss, know your passion and don't be afraid to be yourself. Open those doors and say a door closes, there's another door that will open that would be maybe a better place for you or a desire that you thought, gee, I didn't think I would have that, but here it is and I love it. Dr. Weiss didn't use these words, but I think if she were here right here, she'd tell you, don't you ever let anybody else tell you what you cannot do. Let's learn together and let's move out. Dr. Weiss, thank you so much for joining us. Our listeners are going to be very interested in knowing enough of your background to be able to identify with the fact that you have punched through, so to speak, the glass ceiling that's frequently associated with women. You have overcome stereotypes. You have overcome some of the stigma that is associated with females. I know our listeners are going to be very interested in some of the past that you have had to endure, maybe, and uh, our listeners who are are particularly the ladies will know that I am a, a man conducting this podcast for the moment. Marty is with me. But feel free to rail on us men if that's appropriate, uh, because we maybe have been the cause for your stereotypes, stigmatizing, and so forth. But Dr. Weiss, thank you for joining us. Oh, it's fun to be here. And your, your questions have made me think through a lot rather than just talk about it. I, I organized it. So I'm very glad that I did that this time. And I've got I've organized it in five different areas because as I went through this, I didn't feel like I was punching through anything. And I didn't actually punch through the the glass ceiling. That fits in the corporate world. And I just kind of oozed my way into a lot of different places, which was a great deal of fun for me. But the, the different challenges I've had to deal with are the first one of the challenge of adapting to the world in which other people expected to be something other than who I really was. So that was the first challenge. I'll go back and and explain each of these, but I just wanna put it into a context. The second challenge was in, in that process of doing it, carrying it out, I was totally shocked by an event in my life that proved that the world wasn't fair. And I had to learn 
something entirely different. And then there was the challenge of once I found out that I could be something else of becoming that person, of, of becoming professionally what I wanted to be, of, of developing. And once I had done that or along with that, I got into, well, if I can do it, I can help other people do it too. And that was the challenge of changing the world. And I have been involved in that challenge for probably 50 years, maybe more. Uh, but that goes along with the other things. And then there's a challenge that kind of gone along with it because I'm kind of a, a loner at heart in some ways. And that's the challenge of joining others and working in community to make the changes. And I've been involved in a lot of different communities. So I can go on and just tell you something about each one. Would you like that? We would. That would... We'd, we'd like to okay. just have your thoughts about each of the five points. Okay. Okay. Uh, the first thing is that I was born into a very loving, well-educated family which is a fantastic advantage, but also something of a challenge because my parents uh, expected me to grow up and fulfill the American dream, or maybe specifically the Jewish American dream, which was to go to college, get an education and marry a rich man. That was what I was supposed to do. Uh, prefer uh, preferably a rich doctor or a rich lawyer, <laughs> doctor preference. They also provided a different model for me because my mom was, I, I recently discovered not, she was 21 when she got an MBA from New York University and was with my father. And that was like in the night, early 1930s. So the model that she had, the model I saw was she was being mommy, but the model I also knew about was that she was this high powered woman who had done this and been a buyer for a department store and things like that. But I was expected to grow up and get my MRS degree as well as my BA or whatever it was. And the world said, be a secretary, be a nurse or be a doctor or, or, or be a teacher. And my father said, don't be a nurse, be a doctor which was a little counter to, to the expectation because that would have been weird. I, so, it, and in college, they were telling me, well, you're just gonna get married so you don't have to take the really hard stuff. So I did that, you know, I did everything that I was gonna do. I did marry a, a man who was in graduate school to become a psychologist, a PhD doctor. And I was supposed to help him do that and all that. And I was working at it and we were about to have our first child. And completely out of the blue, the baby was stillborn. We didn't know it at the time. It was, it was a horrible shock. I was just devastated and everything was, it was just shattered. I had no idea. So this was a challenge of deal, learning to deal with the grief, learning that Everything I've been told about the world, if you do everything right, then you can get exactly what you want and do exactly what you want. That just wasn't there. I couldn't do that. And it took a long time. It, it seemed like a long time. I mean, nine months historically is not a long time when you're as old as I am now. But it took nine months to get pregnant again. And when I finally did, about three or four months later, my husband told me that he was in love with his co-therapist and mm. he wanted to end the marriage. And that was where I discovered something. I discovered depths of myself I didn't know because I got really furious. And, and, and I knew his co-therapist and if there, if there was somebody else in the world who was really like me, it was her. And it was like, he, I didn't know exactly what was going on, but I was very, very upset. And I was furious at him and I told him so. 
And at which point he got the idea that maybe he shouldn't get a divorce. And we weathered that, but it changed things a lot. And the next five years in one, in the one hand were about being pregnant, having babies. It was like a, a five year fugue in some ways, but on the other side, by the time we had a, a two-year-old and I was pregnant again with our next baby, which again, I lost, but that was an early one. We had an experience where he was in training in California for transactional analysis, which I don't know whether you remember, I'm okay, you're okay, and games people play. I was there as a wife and I was hanging out with the other wives and somebody said, why don't we go to the conference, which they were having. And we got a babysitter for all the babies, all the kids. And we showed up at the conference. And I learned, I was really, really excited about what I saw going on and about some, I saw a woman who was presenting a paper, actually it was for somebody else, but I had no idea that women like her existed. And she later became one of my mentors. She was, she had been Rosie the Riveter. She was a, a minister. She was a brilliant, brilliant woman. And it was like, wow. And at the same time, I met somebody and I introduced myself as, oh, I'm Jonathan's wife. And she looked at me and she said, oh, I'm a person in my own right. And I was a bit stunned. I, Marty is reacting here. I can see her. She knows about this kind of stuff. <laughs> so that, that was the beginning. It was like, oh, you mean you can be a person in your own right and not there? And I'd also had some therapy and various things. So I was beginning to come out and see what I wanted to do, who I wanted to be. When we went back to that conference a, a couple of years later, I was sitting there with my husband and having a great conversation and you know, just going ahead and somebody sat down with us and, and joined the conversation and then said to me, you're not free. I said, well, of course I'm free. My husband lets me do anything I want to do. And then I went, oops, <laughs> because that was the, epitome of not being free. Well, at that point, she basically drew me into feminism, which was a, the incipient second wave of, of feminism that was just starting out and got me involved. And my, my world changed. I started seeing things completely differently. I started seeing the world that, you know, I'm not going to be mad at men for creating it because that was the world that they were living in too. And they had stress and strain too, but they couldn't see things from a woman's point of view. They couldn't see how really oppressed we were and how we were kept down and kept in our place and not allowed to achieve our potential. And my nature, whatever it is, whenever something interested me, I would go full out and learn about it just because I wanted to. And I didn't necessarily have the certification. I didn't necessarily have the degree. I didn't necessarily have anything, but I just dive in and just learn because it was interesting. While that was going on, I was fascinated by TA and just kept learning everything I could and taking every training I could. And every training and I, by that time, I was a teacher. I was a classroom teacher. And every training was about psychotherapy. They weren't using it in schools or anything like that. But I kept saying, I could use this in the classroom. This would be really, really great. And I wanted to learn more, and I wanted to learn more. And so I did. And one day, my, one of my mentors, another teacher, another woman, said, you know, you're about ready to take your clinical exams. Well, I had a BA, no professional degree, whatever, but she was inviting me to take my exams to be a psychotherapist in a professional organization and get certified. And I did. 
there I was with a certification as a psychotherapist. By that time, I wasn't a classroom teacher anymore. We had moved to Colorado and we were starting the TA community. And again, this was spreading some, well, maybe this was the first time I was spreading something that I knew, spreading the information about it. And we were having a really interesting time having meetings and I was organizing them. And my husband and I were teaching transactional analysis, often to teachers, sometimes to therapists. And finally, he left the job he had and he and some colleagues opened an office. And I said, I want to be one too. I, I, want, I want an office. So I got to be a psychotherapist without any kind of a formal license or anything. It was the 70s. Things were good. I had a great time. Meanwhile, I was sneaking in teaching feminism. I was teaching a class called A Woman's Life Is, which always led to starting a consciousness raising group. And so I was just dotting the world with consciousness raising groups for feminism while I was doing that. And I also became a certified feminist therapist, which led to another interesting track. So things developed, you know, one onto another. We had to learn how to balance work and family because I was working, my husband was working, we were doing basically the same stuff. One day I had a program where I was working with about 30 people and he had a couple of clients and one of the kids was sick. And so he immediately started talking about how I should stay home. And, you know, he could maybe fill in for me on the program or reschedule it or, or something like that. And I woke up and I said, uh-uh, you reschedule. I will do my thing and I'll get out there. That kind of broke things up for us. It was like, Oh, yeah. I mean, because I had been in, was, and probably still am in a relationship where we were taught to be codependent. The world was codependent. The world said, be codependent, do it that way, be the woman behind the man, support him. And I was doing that very well. But it wasn't until we were in a workshop together where we did personality profiles. And in the personality profile, it became very, very clear. I was the leader. I had the leader profile and he had the support profile. And we'd been trying to do it the opposite way. I was trying to support him and he was trying to lead while I was pushing really hard from behind. So that helped us switch and things got a lot easier at that point, although we still had to deal with the world. Like when he was home, because it was his turn to take care of the kids and a reporter was interviewing him about his work. She, she said, oh, you're babysitting. And he said, no, I'm taking care of my children. And she said, oh, but you're babysitting. He said, no, it's my responsibility to take care of my children sometimes. <laughs> so we were both out there at that point. And we learned something new too. We learned a whole set of material from the transactional analysis community about how people discount each other in their conversations. And we, we had converted a whole community into the whole TA learning community into becoming aware of that. And that changed things a lot. Dr. Weiss is encouraging you to know who you are, be aware of who you are, that is, your strengths, your passion, your personality. For a personality, Marty and I are DISC certified. We strongly encourage you to get a DISC personality profile, which defines how you're wired, your personality, who you are, your disposition. Dr. Weiss explains that she was a part of a family whose mindset was women are supposed to fill a defined role. Dr. Weiss, through a personality profile, determined, and she and her husband reckoned with the fact that she is a leader, he is a supporter, which, to some degree, was counter to the stereotypical roles they were each 
assigned to follow. So once we know who we are in our strengths and we pursue those strengths, the passions, we can conquer virtually anything that we choose to as Dr. Weiss continues to explain, never stop learning and push on open doors. We were going along on, in this way and a colleague challenged us and said, well, you know, if we're so smart, how come you're, we're not rich? Have we got a workshop for you? And we were invited to participate in a workshop in Vermont about money and you, which was so exciting that we wanted to bring it back to our colleagues in, in Denver and our community in Denver. So we arranged to do that. That was fine. That was wonderful. Except we didn't, I certainly didn't expect to be producing it for five years but other people had other ideas and I went along with them. Codependency, once more, giving things up until one day I woke up and I didn't want to get out of bed. It was just, this is wrong. This, this, is, not, this is not what I need to be doing. And I took another really big risk. And that was the risk of saying, I'm pulling out of this. You can keep doing it, but I'm not going to be codependent about it anymore. I'm going to do other things. And by that time, we'd been married, I think, for 17 years and working together for about 13. And I was absolutely terrified because I was putting our business at risk. I was putting our, ther our marriage at risk. And I didn't know what was going to happen. And it worked. <laughs> it, it, it just, it like, Okay, he kept doing the workshop for another six months, but without my support, which he wasn't even recognizing how much I was doing to make it happen. Without my support, kind of, he lost interest. And then we moved on and along with everything else, we had become experts in a particular form of psychotherapy, which was later identified as inner child work. When we left this practice, we were kind of wandering around the world for a while, started doing some other things. And because of the feminist therapist part, I had written a chapter in a book. That chapter, I, I had had to deliver a paper, which became a, a chapter in a book. And then that chapter in a book grew to a monograph and a, a chapter in another book. And maybe a chapter in something else. I don't exactly remember the order of it. It was very interesting. And finally, we got a contract to write a book, which was called Recovery from Codependency. It's never too late to reclaim your childhood. It was about doing inner child work. And we connected with John Bradshaw, who was doing Bradshaw and the Family on public television at that point. And he wrote the, pub, the introduction for the book and became a friend. And after I got that book published, it was like, oh, well, if I can get a book published, I can get a PhD. And so as a mid-career professional, working full-time, raising kids, I went back to school, uh, an external degree, and I finally got my PhD. So we then were two Dr. Weisses in the family. Then came the challenge of changing the world. <laughs> Although I'd been doing it earlier. I mean, with the feminist work, and with the communication work, that was really working fine. But then I started teaching professionals about how to do the kind of work I was doing. I had written a book earlier and gotten a stack of rejections about three inches high. That was really my second book, but then the first one was published and then another book and another, we were on the speaking circuit for, the adult children of alcoholics movement, which was exciting at the time. And we were doing the inner child work and had, had a book that was selling well. It sold, it was a bestseller really. I mean, now you, no way, no way does anybody sell 40,000 copies unless they're, you know, New York Times bestseller, but we sold 40,000 copies. And life was very, very, very busy. We were on the speaking circuit. We had our therapy practice. 
I was working on my PhD, I had a contract for another book that happened more or less accidentally because I had heard the world of psychotherapy was changing. Managed care was coming in. We weren't going to be able to do the work that we had been doing. It was just too far out on the edge. They would not cover it. We didn't want to do it. And we heard about coaching, which was brand new at the time. Nobody had really thought very much about it. There was like one full, one man pushing it. And we got connected with him, became coaches as well as psychotherapists and developed a whole new area of practice and a new way of doing things. I had written another thing sort of accidentally. I, I was going to write something about my business book, which got done in there somewhere. All of a sudden I found myself writing tips for relationships. And I was writing this book with using a team for support, using a, a team of people on the internet. And it was such an exciting time. I was in the coach community and I was doing that. And I wrote something, which was a little pamphlet called 124 Tips for Having a Great Relationship. And these things don't sort of, the timeline isn't, isn't clear here, but that led to me becoming a relationship coach and writing books on relationships. In what's happened, I wound up with a series of seven books on relationships and I was absolutely ready to retire. I was 70 years old and things were okay. And I was having fun. The world was good. And I was thinking, it's time to quit. And then I came upon this incredible energy therapy process called logosynthesis, which came out of Switzerland, which was almost unknown in the United States, and which let us do the work that we were doing helping people change in a fraction of the time with a fraction of the pain. It was so amazing that we had to go learn it. Because again, I said, my, my pattern was, you go learn what you want to learn. You know, it doesn't matter what it is. And in the learning of it, over a period of years, my husband and I became the only certified logosynthesis practitioners and then master practitioners in the United States, and we still are. There, there are a couple more people who are getting certified and who are trainers and practitioners, but nobody is at our level at this point. And I decided that this process was written about in European professional language. And it was so available, it was so useful to the general public that I wanted to write something about how to use it with, how to just use it for, for yourself, for your own self-growth. And with, with the founder of Logosynthesis, Dr. Lammers, who was a Swiss psychologist, was and is a brilliant man. I wrote the first book for the general public that became very popular and introduced a lot of professionals as well to Logosynthesis. For a long time, it was the first book that people were invited to read. And people would read and go, oh, it works. And there are about 100 reviews on Amazon saying, wow, it works. Really, really exciting. So I did that. So it's, it's been a wonderful, wonderful trip. I mean, there have been challenges, many of them. But every one of them has led to an opportunity of one kind or another. So it, it's, been, it's been wonderful. The, the different communities that I have been involved in and looking back on this, as I was preparing for this talk with you, it was like, okay, there was the feminist therapist community that helped me manage what you call the glass ceiling. It helped me make, make the strides of becoming who I am. It supported me. There was the transactional analysis community, which 50 years later, I'm still involved with. And now I'm one of the senior, you know, very senior people there. And I'm not doing very much. I just recently retired from the United States Steering Committee of Transactional Analysis, but it's all over the world now. I was active in the women's business community as I was running a small business and getting help and support from other women 
mutually. And we were growing together. And now I'm involved in an, an older woman's community where we still support each other in learning and growing. I was also involved in, was and is and am involved in the coaching community. And there's an author's community and there's an international logosynthesis community. I just met somebody new in it today that I had just known peripherally and discovered that we have a lot in common. So life has been very, very exciting. So I've, I think I've run out. I mean, I could go back and do more, but just, just, I think that gives you a sense of what it is, Ron. Dr. Weiss, congratulations. You're a life success. I want to see if I have processed uh, much of what you're saying correctly. You were a part of a, a very a vibrant family, but there were some expectations of maybe fulfilling three roles. I'm going to use my own term. Uh, one of the implicit roles of a female was to be barefoot in the kitchen and, mm -hmm. and supportive and so forth. You did not say that. My, my, I'm using that term <laughs> merely for the sake of emphasis. But you were with some a particular female mentor, Rosie the Riveter, who it seems <laughs> to me helped you determine that you have far more capability than what you were being able to do. She helped you become the real, I guess I would use the term Laurie Weiss, by developing your potential. And I'm using some terms you did. Well, let, let me correct you a little bit there. She was not the only one. There were three or four different women of her generation who were helping me in all kinds of ways. I loved it. I was so blessed. And it, it's been my joy to try and pass that on to other women. So now go back to what you were doing. Sorry oh, to interrupt. All right. but I no, that is that good. Uh, through four women, they helped you realize your full potential. And you, I, it seems, felt that uh, with their mentorship, you really can be the lady that you were, let's say, born to be, you're, to live your potential, albeit it didn't fit the family mold. And so if I've come somewhat close to summarizing what you said, I'm very interested in what your thoughts are, uh, Dr. Weiss, for the females listening right now. And it could apply to any male, I think. I don't think this is gender specific, but for any person who's not living their potential and they feel that there's something more to me, there's something more to life and so forth, how would you tell those people to discover their full potential and be the Dr. Weiss that I sense you have become, but you had to come out from underneath some stereotypes? I definitely came out from under stereotypes. Stereotypes still exist. There, there's a lot more space, but still, you know, women still do the brunt of the housework and the brunt of the child care work. And, things like that. And men are still expected to be real men. And that's defined in different ways. I mean, real men do cry. Real men really have feelings. Real men are fabulous. So the, the thing that I would say is look for other people who are like you. And there are so many more places to look now because people can look online and find some of them. They can be on Facebook and they can find a tribe of people who are emerging, people who are trying to do it and get tips from other people that maybe aren't even in the same physical location. Read, learn, join up with other people. There's meetup groups. You know, if you're interested in learning about something, go ahead and learn about it. You don't have to have a big plan. Feel free. We're, we're taught to have very narrow visions of who we're supposed to be. Open up. If something looks interesting, try it out. Explore it. Maybe stop playing games on, on, with your device for a while and just see what's out there with real people. Volunteer. Try something new. And then if you are interested, talk to somebody and maybe 
six people are going to say, huh? But the seventh will go, yeah, me too. Find other people and do it. Do it. You mentioned personality profile. Was there an aspect of the maybe in combination, the personality profile who helped determine who you are? Was there a matter of maybe through the four women mentors that you defined, determined your strengths? Is that what helped define the real Dr. Lori Weiss? I don't think so. Not in terms of defining. They opened doors. They said, look this way, try this way. Something I didn't mention in terms of my development, another woman saw what I was doing, said, go study with Jean Houston, who is an incredible teacher, spiritual teacher. I didn't know it, but I went to study. I went for a week and it changed my life. And then 10 years later, she offered another program and that changed my life even further. But it was like, okay, they opened the doors, I went through. They didn't say you should go this way. They said, here, I'll make a place for you on this committee, even though everybody on this committee has always been credentialed before. Let's have you on it too. Go ahead, join it. And I joined it and I changed it. And that, that was what they did. They didn't say, here's how. They said, try it. Now, I'm very curious, the doors that were opened for you, it was your initiative where you tried different doors or you found some that worked, but did you experience any failures? And, did, and if yes to that, and I'm supposing you probably did, did that take you back to, well, maybe I was never meant to be what you're trying to do? I, no, not, not any failures that sent me back that way. There were certainly failures. I mean, uh, a three-inch stack of rejection letters was not nice. And that was definitely a failure until it became a success. But even that led to a mutual mentoring agreement with another woman who taught me writing skills by helping me edit the book. And she did that, and I taught her therapy script skills. And we had a great time together. I never questioned that I could use what I knew. But there were always questions about how could I do it? You know, in, in what format would I get to do it? Because the world was not set up for that. At, what, at one point, somebody, I did a presentation for marriage and family therapy, for marriage and family therapists, and somebody invited me to join their organization. And they sent me a thing, well, maybe if I got a master's degree in marriage and family therapy, and then started at the beginning, maybe I could become a marriage and family therapist. And, you know, it was like, well, all right, I'm already a marriage and family therapist, but I'm not going to get your certification because that just doesn't make any sense. But in other cases, I was able to pick up the certifications later, or I didn't even know I would at least twice, I didn't know I was working for any kind of certification. In transactional analysis, when I was learning it, I was just learning it because I wanted to. And in logo synthesis, the same way. I was learning it because I wanted to. And in coaching, I had already learned it. I was already a master. And they had a program for being grandfathered in as a master certified coach. And it was early on and I had people vouch for me and I was certified. I was grandfathered in as a grandmothered in perhaps as a master certified coach. So those are certifications that just sort of came along the way. The PhD I did work for, and that was hard work. And that was to be official in the world. It made a difference but I couldn't do it in a conventional program. I had to do it in an external program that I could arrange to do what I wanted to do because that was my style. And I combined three fields. I combined child development and adult education and psychotherapy in one field. So even there, I was a pioneer. And the exciting part is that work 
maybe getting into a UN program in South Africa some 30 years later. So, I mean, 25 years later, it, it's just, it's mind boggling to me that that could be happening. Well, several personal characteristics come to my mind. One of them is resilience. One of, another one is you have a determination. Once you have had discovered yourself, your strengths, through the power and the mentoring of four other women. What I'm determining from you, Dr. Weiss, is that you, after knowing yourself, your capabilities, you made up your mind that uh, you were going to go in a direction you're going and nobody will keep you from achieving. If I am recalling correctly, you earned your doctorate degree at age 54 or something very close to that. And you are 54. a very very determined lady who, once you've set your course and your mind, no one is going to keep you from achieving the goals that you have set. Um, have I mischaracterized any aspect of uh, Dr. Laurie Weiss? One little bit, which is I don't set goals for the most part. I Well, little goals, but I, I don't have anything about what's going to happen. It's nobody can keep me from learning what I want to learn. That's what nobody can keep me from, because I keep doing that. I want to say, and correct me if this is not right, to the person that wants to do something, would you say, don't be afraid to be you, just do it? I would say, don't be afraid to be you, just do it. And if you start to be you and people push you back, then maybe you don't show them that aspect of you. My parents never saw my, the whole me. They saw what they wanted to see. And I was careful not to upset them. And they were proud of what they saw. They were glad of that. And somewhat distressed that I was back in the workforce before my children were grown. But they worked it out. It was okay. So I would say, be careful because sometimes there's a lot of pushback. I mean, I'm sure you've experienced that as a woman. Mm -hmm. And so go gently, but keep on doing it. Mm -hmm. Don't stop just because somebody else says that, oh, that's not you. Of course you can't do that. Women can't do that. Do it anyway. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I, I know, Marty, that, that I, I know that this is an audio, but your listeners don't know that we can see each other. And I could see Marty cheering me on as I'm going through this. <laughs> it's really fun. Yeah. Another thing I'm learning from you, Dr. Weiss, is I think you're telling our listeners, never stop learning, never stop having a desire to read, learn. The more you learn, the more your mind is stimulated into thinking different things. Anything is possible. Am I characterizing yeah. uh, a lot of you? Yes, definitely. Definitely. Think. <laughs> Don't... You know, don't, don't swallow things. Think about them. Question things. Dr. Weiss, that is huge advice. And I want to thank you on behalf of our listeners for accomplishing what you have. You've given a lot of women, a lot, let's just say a lot of people hope, because I don't think that what you said is gender specific. You have certainly overcome a lot of stigmas, but there are many of us who have limited ourselves because of limiting beliefs. And I want to encourage our listeners to know there's no limit to what we can do. Let's surround ourselves with people who will encourage us. Let's have an insatiable desire to learn. Let's keep thinking as you are and everything is possible. Yay. Love that. And my books will help. Send them to my website where they can see my books. <laughs> and thank you, Dr. Weiss. Uh, we are going to reference the 13 books you have authored, and we hope that many people will want those books. I hope so. I hope so, because they're all about helping people grow. And that is a fabulous thing that you are pursuing, that we want to advance people and help people grow. Thank you for your heart, Dr. Weiss. We love it. Thank you so much. I've enjoyed this. Dr. Weiss made it very clear the impact on her life of labeling, stereotypes, expectations. Some of this can result in what is known as limiting beliefs. 
it tends to put us into what I call a pigeonhole. That is, your expectations are supposed to conform to whatever the thoughts are at the time and the labeling, the expectations, whatever term we put to it, those labels may have the end result of manifesting themselves in a way that limits us from living our full potential. I think Dr. Weiss would say that there was a time in her life when she was not living her full potential because of the environment in which she was raised. And I don't think she's blaming anybody. It's just the way things were. But through four ladies, she was able to determine what her potential is, what her strengths are, and it's through that relationship that she was able to clearly discern, be aware of who she is, and Dr. Weiss was very poignant, very articulate in saying, don't let anybody define who you are, don't let anyone limit you to live your full God-designed potential, but rather find those who believe in you, those who can advance you to your full potential and live that potential. That potential includes learning, and if we have an insatiable desire to learn, that can help stimulate our thinking to where there are opportunities Firstly, everything in life is an opportunity if we have the mindset that we are an opportunity maximizer, that irrespective of anything that happens in our life, we'll make an opportunity of that. Dr. Weiss was very articulate in saying she was that opportunity optimizer and she overcame things of the past, those limiting beliefs, to where she turned them into opportunities. It's a very inspiring opportunity. I want to help you to determine what your potential is, to know what you exactly you were designed to do, created to do best, your strengths. Part of that is a personality assessment. Marty and I are certified DISC professionals of the advanced level. We can help you determine your personality style through which we can help you determine your strengths. We are also certified coaches through the John Maxwell team. We can help you determine exactly what your strengths are, help you work through any limiting beliefs you may have to help you reach and live your full God-designed potential. We know what it is to be totally fulfilled, living your potential, seeking your passion, and doing exactly what it is you were destined to do in working toward advancing other people. We have that fulfillment. We want to share that fulfillment with you. We hope we can warrant a five-star rating through this podcast. We hope you'll want to subscribe and pass this podcast on to your friends within your social media community. We hope you'll share this podcast with your Facebook friends, your LinkedIn connections, your Instagram community, everybody within your social media group. And we hope you'll choose to share this podcast with others. Contact us, ron at thecooperculture.com or marty, M-A-R-T-Y, at thecooperculture.com. If you feel that you are not living to your full potential, contact us. Let's schedule a 30-minute complimentary coaching session to where you can determine through this session if we would be the right ones to help you live your full potential, to help you overcome what may be some limiting beliefs, as Dr. Weiss was saying in her life, that she had to overcome some of those stereotypes and stigmas, and some of us need to overcome the same. Marty and I have each overcome those stigmas, those limiting beliefs, to where we have the total life fulfillment of living our potential. We hope you will share this podcast with others. Contact us. Let's work together to advance others, to help them live their full potential. And we look forward to working with you.